back again, uh, I would like to introduce the second speaker, which is Professor Jiang. Howard Jiang is a professor of history at UC Davis and although born in Taiwan, has grown up in Canada and studied across a multitude of US American universities, including I think he did his PhD in Princeton uh, and is uh, at UC Davis as a professor of history for, uh, since 2017. Please enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Howard Jiang and the title of my talk is Transtopia and the Recent History of Gender in Taiwan. Okay, my talk today draws on my book, Transtopia and the Sinophone Pacific that came out last year. Uh, in queer studies, we often face a conundrum how to grapple with both the potentials and limitations of categories derived from the West. Um, by advocating a move from transgender to transtopia, my goal is to showcase a way by which a new keyword can be generated from the specific context of Taiwanese history and culture. Although the field of queer Asian studies has decolonized Western theoretical norms, we must turn this decolonial gaze upon itself in order to avoid reinstating an opposite set of biases, that is the scaffolding of Asia nativism. So to direct us to a kind of queer history that resists Western centrism and China centrism at the same time, I propose a new theoretical construct, what I call transtopia. In the broadest sense, transtopia stands for anything that exceeds transphobia. But in practice, I use transtopia to refer to different scales of gender transgression that are not always recognizable through the Western notion of transgender. The point is to acknowledge that different trans expressions coexist across time and space. And in this way, transtopia deconstructs a stable and constant narrative template by which transness is validated. It leads one to question a one-sided hierarchy, often embedded in the umbrella concept of transgender, where the criteria of determination is transness, or to put it more precisely, different degrees of transness. In this scheme, one can be more trans and another can be less trans, and transness effectively becomes evaluable, measurable, and quantifiable. Nowhere is the politics of transness more pronounced than in cross-cultural history, um, especially with the institutionalization of transgender as a casual category in the 1990s, right? So um, these are different examples from South Asia, Indonesia, Mexico and Native America. Um, and uh, none of these uh, individualized examples actually suggest that the Western category of transgender is the best or the most adequate way uh, as they apply to uh, the life experiences of these queer subjects. So transtopia calls for a more egalitarian platform and as such has literally been crying for a name for itself. I'm not interested in uh, who qualifies as more properly trans. But the concept of transtopia is concerned with how different actors relate to one another through the category of trans. Uh, in this way, I'm borrowing from Adrian Rich's theory of lesbian existence to conceptualize transgender as a continuous category. I ask, what if transgenderism is not the exception, but the norm? by which all embodied subjects can be measured and understood. To demonstrate my point about shifting our theory from transgender to transtopia, I will focus on three examples. One, global sex change. Two, the history of a Sinophone trans category called Ren Yao, 
or we can translate it as the human prodigy. I'll come back to that in my second section. And three, the changing nature of Tongzhi politics and post-millennial Taiwan. The merging of trends with Topia occasions a generative tool to disrupt the stability and coherence of knowledge about the past. So my first example is Global Christine. The first example brings us back to the summer of 1952, which witnessed a nationwide publicity on the MTF transsexual Xie Jian Shun in Taiwan. A native of Chaozhou, Canton, she had joined the army at the age of 16 and lost both of her parents by 18. She came to Taiwan with the National Army in 1949. Uh, four years later, in August in 1953, the 36-year-old Chie visited the Tainan 518 Military Hospital for a physical exam due to regular abdominal pain. Doctors diagnosed Xie's intersex condition and initiated a series of sex change operations. Her story made bian xing ren, or transsexual, a household term in the 1950s. Her story soon triggered media sensationalism in post-war Taiwan. Uh, and enthusiastic commentators labeled her the Chinese Christine. Um, and what is the Chinese Christine referring to? It was actually a direct reference to the American XGI transsexual celebrity, Christine Jorgensen. The American Christine had traveled to Denmark for sex reassignment surgery, and as a result, attracted worldwide attention due to her glamorous feminine looks. You can see a photo of her, her on here on PowerPoint. In the early 1950s, the popular analogy of the two Christines reflected the growing influence of American culture on the Republic of China at the initial peak of the Cold War. As it turns out, the story of global Christine did not stop in the Asia Pacific. Uh, so far, we have encountered the American Christine and the Chinese Christine. After Jorgensen returned to New York, the government in Mexico soon claimed that they too have their own Christine. Uh, as you may recall, the Taiwanese, Taiwanese newspapers uh, reported the story of Xie Jian in August 1953, and Mexican newspapers announced the sensational story of Marta Olmos, the Mexican Christine, in May 1954. Both Xie and Olmos, like Jorgensen, transformed into a woman through an array of medical interventions, and their stories drew media interest across the Pacific, appearing as far apart as in Singapore, Hong Kong, Sydney, Melbourne, Maryborough, Torreon, and various cities in the United States. Even though Jorgensen, Xie, and Olmos wrote to stardom in the short span of a year and a half, right from December 1952 to May 1954, their experience actually re differed remarkably in terms of the narratives they generated, right? In terms of uh, what they're suggesting about the successful outcome of uh, sex reassignment. So sex change was a story of personal triumph for Jorgensen, but it translated remedy treating the intersexuality of Xie, a Republican Chinese soldier who acquiesced to a total of nine surgeries with great reluctance. Almost welcomed male-to-female genital reconstruction operations, which her medical team authorized and pitched as a solution to male homosexuality. Throughout the 1950s, uh, author authoritarian regimes in both Taiwan and Mexico were backed by the US government. For our purposes, it is noteworthy that the fashioning of the different Christine narratives uh, produced a fluid spectrum of Christian meanings. Despite how the competing narratives all framed sex reassignment as the fulcrum of bodily experience, what the surgery accomplished on the personal and collective levels vary by region in different ways. So we need to start paying attention to uh, subjects like Xie and Olmos, not because of their nominal status as a non-Western variant of an original trans prototype, uh, right? The relationship of the copy to the original is the trouble. But due to how they unsettle claims of transgender roots that are locked to a particular time, place, or set of social attributes, these examples frustrate 
any definitive, sorry, definitive claims of trans authenticity. It no longer makes sense to uphold a single figure, be it Jorgensen or Xie, or any region for that matter, as the ultimate yardstick for the historical production of transness. My second example of a transphobian construct is one that has long circulated in Chinese history, that is Ren Yao. The term originally referred to any human physical anomaly or freak. It first appeared in the philosophical writing of Xunzi, dating to 3rd century BC. And to the best of my knowledge, the term's first usage in the sense of gender crossing appeared in the history of Southern dynasties, uh, Nan Shi, that was published in the Tang Dynasty in the 7th century. I should point out that throughout Chinese history, even though there are examples in which the term Ren Yao is explicitly associated with gender crossing, this meaning coexisted alongside a broader definition of human freak or anomaly. Ren Yao is a concept that illustrates what Western queer theorists have more recently called queer inhumanism. In the late Qing and early Republican period, the category gradually changed over time to surrender the non-gender connotations of its inhumanism. As China entered the PRC era, the mainland remained relatively silent on the topic of Ren Yao, but in contrast, Taiwan not only publicized the stories about the first Chinese transsexual, Xie Jianshun, it also became a place where the lay public was bombarded with stories about Zhen Xiaohuang, the most famous Ren Yao in the 1950s. In general, we can uh, divide the journalism of uh, Zhen Xiaohuang's case into four waves. Um, although his gender ambiguity was, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> although his gender ambiguity was the most important selling point of his story, a crucial turning point in the Zen Sega occurred in 1954. Um, as I uh, discussed earlier, by that point, uh, the idea of human sex change has circulated widely in Taiwan due to Xie Zhenzhen's story. <coughs> Excuse me. Zeng was dazzled by the two glamorous Christines, and in 1954, he stated for the first time his determination to undergo sex reassignment. In the historiography of Ren Yao, um, the category is often associated with individuals who switched their sex, especially in the late imperial period. However, what distinguished the context of post-war Taiwan was the emergence of this notion of Yan Xing Ren as an available identity category. So Zen's desire for a sex change operation became a chief force in shaping the public understanding of his Ren Yao embodiment from that point onward. His interest in sex resentment makes a decisively Sinophone contribution to the history of Ren Yao. As a Chinese category, Ren Yao has roots in continental China but its most intricate elaborations in the mid 20th century came to light in Taiwan. Again, the point here is not to measure the earlier Ren Yao examples against later ones or against other non-Ren Yao queer subjects for that matter. We must not start with a preconceived set of transgender criteria. The affinity between Ren Yao and transgender is precisely what is at stake and needs to be thought through cautiously. So thinking about Ren Yao, a recurrent concept, alongside Bian Xing Ren, a new identity marker, reveals their interreference and interconnection. Both categories took form in seemingly separate Sinophone contexts, and each term denotes a different configuration of transness. But both categories soon acquired new kinds of meaning and assumed particular urgency. If we consider the transsexual as more trans than the human prodigy, this flattens their historical resonance and cripples our queer sensibility. The queerness of Zen's Ren Yao status derived from not only gender ambiguity, but also all sorts of subversive behavior, which was already part of Ren Yao's history. As Zen's declaration of interest in sex change makes clear, the two configurations of transness were mutually shaped and understood by actors in relation to one another on a historical continuum. 
In today's parlance, Yuan Yao often represents an insulting, transphobic term. But as I have shown, the queerness of Yuan Yao can be viewed as an outcome of a historical process. It is a process that approximates Taiwan's stature as out of sync with major imperial powers like China and earlier on Japan, and of course later on the United States. Like Taiwan, Yuan Yao has been left out of mainstream historical comprehension. And similar to Yuan Yao, Taiwan has been objectified as an historical aporia that sits uncomfortably with narratives of colonialism, nation building, and global cosmopolitanism. In my final example, I bring home the Transtopia thesis by rethinking the history of Tongzhi. We know that the concept of Tongzhi has historically been queered first and foremost in Sinophone locations, and its queer currency was then imported back into mainland PRC. But what happened after the millennial term? How did Tongzhi come to signify an all-embracing notion of queerness today? I suggest that any understanding of the history of Tongzhi is incomplete without accounting for the increasing visibility and promotion of transgender rights. Xenophon queering did not stop in the 1980s and 1990s. The Western category of transgender was creolized by Xenophon activists to redefine and retool the political expediency of Tongzhi. The first and foremost milestone in the queering of Tongzhi is the legislation of the 2004 Gender Equity Education Act. Which consolidated a broad based public awareness of gender fluidity in Taiwan. The act was initially called the Equality of the Two Sexes Education Act, um, and the tragic event that called attention to the pervasiveness of gender variance and, um, in fact, animated the rebranding of the act uh, from uh, Equality of the Two Sexes Education Act to the Gender Equity Education Act um, is a high profile social event, the Yeongji incident. The story began on April 20th, 2000, at the Gaoshu Junior High School in Pingtung. Five minutes before a class session, class session, sorry, ended on that day, the ninth grader Ye uh, raised his hand to seek permission to use the bathroom. With the teacher's permission, Ye left the classroom. Instead of returning to class as usual, however, Ye was found lying in a pool of blood in the bathroom. His classmates found him trembling in pain with signs of head injury. The school immediately sent him to the emergency room in a nearby hospital. But the medical team was unable to save him. He passed away on the next morning. And on the day of the incident, the school actually cleaned the bathroom swiftly and thoroughly without filing a police report. And subsequently, Ye's family requested the Pingdong District Prosecutor's Office to carry out a forensic determination of the cause of his death. In June, the Ministry of Education convened an emerging subcommittee to investigate the case. The investigation began at Junior, sorry, Gosu Junior High School later that month, looking into the procedures by which the school handled the case, uh, the gender friendliness of the campus, and the uh, past record of campus violence. One of the most significant consequences of the incident was the revamping of the Equality of the Two Sexes Education Act in 2002. Uh, during their investigation, the emergency subcommittee learned that yet having a persist persistent victim of campus-wide bullying due to his feminine temperament. Um, for, for his outwardly uh, girly manner, uh, Ye Yongzhi was constantly harassed by his classmates, such as by being forced to drop his pants to reveal his genitals. Many students made fun of him. Sometimes they would go for and play pranks on him by targ targeting his gender expression. And this was the main culprit behind his decision to always use the bathroom immediately before class session ended. The law professor, Chen Huixing, who was involved in the investigation and the planning of the proposal, uh, made it very clear that it was really yes death that pushed them to realize the necessity of uh, respecting students with a diverse range of gender orientation and was really that that um, uh, pushed them to rename the act so that uh, it would address a wider range of gender expression. 
The seminal impact of the Ye incident reflected the changing nature of feminist and Tongzhi activism. In the early 2000s, uh, feminist and sexual minority uh, rights activists began to work together to elevate a language of gender fluidity. This overturned one, the long-standing focus on women's rights within the feminist movement, and two, the exclusive preoccupation with sexual politics in the gay and lesbian movement. The incorporation of gender diversity uh, conditioned a reframing of Tongzhi activism in post-millennial Taiwan. Although public discourses rarely associated Ye with the label of transgender, his tragedy instigated a systemat systemic reconsideration of gender as a non-binary pluralist attribute. After Ye Yongzhi, the social mainstream um, uh, in, uh, paid a lot much more attention to the issue of gender variance and the case also instigated an epistemic shift that is the incorporation of the t the transgender alongside uh, bisexuality the b into a renewed definition of tongzhi this reconceptualization was most explicitly crystallized in the Taipei LGBT Civil Rights Festival, so Taipei Tongwanjie, which was launched in 2000 and preluded the first official LGBTQ pride in Taiwan, right? So it's really telling, for example, early on, it was just about Taipei Lesbian Gay Festival, but later on, they changed the English name to LGBT. It's a clear indication of how uh, trans and bisexual issues became part, incorporated into um, the aim of the festival. So the festivals, in essence, queered Tongzhi by bringing the fluid definition of gender into the wider context of political activism. So as the first LGBTQ prides in the Sinophone world unfolded in Taipei, an inclu inclusive notion of queerness had begun to formalize within the Tongzhi movement that stood by rather than excluded transgender interest. And this owed in large part to the ratification of the Gender Equity Education Act following the Ye incident. So um, just to make a quick point here, right, that the transtopian approach allows us to recognize uh, the importance of Ye to the Tongzhi movement and to Taiwanese history of gender without assuming a proto-transgender identity in Ye. So I'll conclude my presentation there. Thank you. So let's discuss gender equality because we had two men or T or whatever gender, and we have a female professor last. So does gender equality actually mean to have women last as the highlight? Uh, this is only leaving you with this question here. Uh, I would like to introduce Professor Zeng. Professor Zeng is an assistant professor at the Department of Taiwanese Literature of National Jungung University, but she has been uh, at the Chinese University in Hong Kong for many years. And before, she did her PhD here. So same place, same school in Washington, in Seattle. Uh, even greater pity that she could not be here. Uh, but we do have her presentation online, so enjoy. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jin Xunhui, and I'm from Taiwan. Um, today, I'm going to present my current topic titled The, the Making of a Hysterotopia, a Spatial Analysis of the Law in Entertainment Business Featuring Foreign Hostesses in Taiwan. Since late 1990s, uh, Taiwan has seen a major migration influx from Southeast Asia and mainland China. Um, and uh, with uh, this trend, uh, we also find um, quite a few uh, law and uh, sex entertainment business uh, emerges in Taiwan, like uh, Yunnan, uh, Tezhong Xiaoshi Dian, which 
features uh, um, women's service, foreign women's service as houses, um, you know, uh, coming in uh, uh, customers who drink and the thing, and also like a Thai massage, um, also featuring foreign women's service. Um, so in this study, I take Yunnan Dian for example to analyze how this social ambivalence space, if I borrow from uh, Bauman's ideals, um, has been maintained in society and how the business makes sense to major migrants who were engaged in this business as a, um, as a hostess. The emergence of a Yunnan Dian could be tracked back to 1990s and the early 2000s when Taiwan has seen the flux of the uh, foreign workers and the major migrants from Southeast Asia and um, China. But the business is soon declined due to the police anti-vice campaign and the decline of the Taiwan's economy, um, I think around 2010. Uh, so you can see uh, disseminations of this Yunnan Dian from industrial park areas to ordinary residential areas uh, throughout the Taiwan. Um, and because of this kind of Yunnan Dian's low-end entertainment uh, place to, um, business, so uh, originally it targeted the patrons uh, the uh, major, ma mainly working class men uh, working in the industrial areas, in industrial park areas. But nowadays, you can see, uh, you know, every every everybody um, can afford it. Uh, who can afford it can go. In this project, I borrow Foucault's Hystopia to analyze uh, the spatial structure of uh, uh, this low-end entertainment business in Taiwan. Um, and uh, Foucault argued that to understand uh, his utopia, we have to understand what utopia is first. So according to him, utopia presents society in the perfect form or turn it upside down, but yet they are sites with real, uh, sorry, sites with no real place. Um, but hysteria uh, are the other side spaces of our living world that exist in reality. So basically they are sites with real places. That in these spaces, um, social order is subject to contest, inversion, and even subs uh, a suspension. So actually in my project, I also want to see how these alternative uh, spaces uh, in this alternative spaces, um, people involved uh, in can create their own rules, sets of uh, values, uh, and also how they use uh, this space for their own. Uh, so Foucault give us some um, typical examples of uh, what heterotopia is are. For example, like boats, boarding schools, military service, hotels, hospitals, prisons, churches, and libraries. And then he argue, he also mentions the Papa Brazo as one of the extreme extreme examples of the heterotopia. Levin Amel's work on the representations of Brussels in Finland literature and uh, films informed my research a lot. According to her, uh, the Brussels is set partly outside the traditional set of moral values, a place in which social interaction is regulated according to a particular set of rules and habits. So it can be seen as an uh, institution within society mirroring and uh, questioning uh, social, uh, sexual morals, ideals of families, uh, femininity, and masculinity. So her ideals um, inform my uh, research, uh, as, and I also follow uh, Foucault's ideals of the, uh, the principle of the uh, heterotopia to, um, to form my um, arguments. Uh, uh, as follows. So first of all, the business is not uh, stable and its operation is a continent. Uh, and there are connections of the apparently incomparable space. And later on, I will uh, analyze the blurred uh, social uh, spatial uh, divisions in this um, uh, specific uh, Yunnan Dian, which I call the beauty garden. Um, and third, uh, there are temporal dimensions embedded in the development of the sex entertainment industry in Taiwan and uh, in the migrant trajectory of the hostess. 
And the fourth, um, the Yunnan Dian is a permeable territory in the sense that despite its purpose for uh, sex entertainment, but actually we can also see very often this non sex related activities also take place in the, these Yunnan Dians. So it actually, I want to argue that you also have a, some um, like um, community based service uh, characteristics. So in general, I argue that it acts as a new independent space for exper experimentations, as other uh, the Brussels or uh, red light industry that it already uh, create involves some uh, public debates about uh, whether Taiwan should establish uh, um, uh, a red light district, a special zone or not. I did my field work at a place I called uh, Beauty Garden in Cloud City, uh, close to Yunlin Xian in Taiwan. Uh, and in the in Beauty Garden, we have a uh, eighteen xiaojie uh, houses and one mama san, two xiaoye, uh, which means uh, waiters, and one cook. And I also uh, I work as a volunteer kitchen cleaner, and uh, uh, I was introduced to customers as xiaoye too. So this is also very interesting phenomenon. Uh, and uh, in terms of the uh, xiaojie's identities uh, upon the arrival, arrivals, one uh, uh, held um, student visa, and the one. Uh, worked as a uh, factory workers and met our uh, husband in the factory, and uh, the rest are uh, were foreign spouses. And uh, interesting, most of them are mothers with at least one child, and uh, all of them are already uh, naturalized, so they are Taiwanese uh, citizens. Uh, and I worked there for three months and doing. Um, uh, intensive in field work in 2014, and afterwards I made a short trips uh, uh, to visit the, the, the beauty garden uh, during summer breaks between uh, 2015 and uh, 2018. Um, this photo shows this iron sheet made a, a house, Tie uh, uh, which is a very cheap material. So it could be. Uh, that could be turned down and rebuilt easily. So um, this is also the future of the, uh, this low-end uh, entertainment business place. And this photo were taken from the front door of the beauty cloud, uh, beauty garden I work at. Um, and the the left side is the kitchen areas, and the the middle one is the door lobby. Uh, and the, the right one is the, the back with the lots of the private uh, bathrooms. And the upper photo shows the rest area uh, beyond the kitchen and the next to the hallway. And you can see a lot of uh, high heels uh, piled up in the back. And the houses uh, just uh, have a drinks or meals at the table while they're working for their customers uh, at, uh, during the dinner time. So they're not afraid of being seen by outsiders or customers. That's what I mean um, by a blurred uh, space. Um, uh, and that there's no um, clear boundaries between the front stage and uh, the backstage. Um, and this is shows the flexibility okay, of the, the business that I will discuss more later on. And the bottom photo shows the police uh, routine check. Uh, the police comes like every one or two weeks while I was working there. It's quite often. Here I want to explore more of the uh, possibility of a create an alternative mode of ordering in this um, social and business space. Uh, and there are some dimensions to look at uh, in this business. Uh, the first part I would like to discuss it, uh, uh, is their labor conditions. Um, so basically, the mama san free uh, provide the free meals and the drinks. Um, but you can see from this photo, actually, they they like to cook by themselves. Not, and they often uh, bring their own ingredients and they, uh, uh, cook together with other. Um, hostess. 
And this is moment I call the the, the home taste moment, um, and they can enjoy the they make the dog place as a home and enjoy the the hometown food and uh, chat with each other during the dinner time. So dinner time is a quite important uh, time uh, uh, at the workplace for them uh, because during this period of time they call their families uh, and they also you know, call their, their, their children to check their homework uh, and uh, you know doing some th this kind of a family business while they're waiting for the, the customers to come. Um, and uh, there's no minimum wage and no contract between uh, the mama-san and the hostess. So unlike other uh, local business or, or higher-end uh, entertainment business, uh, since there's no uh, minimum wage and no contract, they can come and go at their wish. Um, and there's also no shift arrangement. So it's based on the uh, the first come, first served uh, rules. Uh, it means like um, if you come early and you sign up and you can leave and the, with the, your name um, and the, and the list, you are uh, able to um, uh, uh, get your customers easier than others come after you. Um, and also there's no insurance or labor rights protection mechanism here. So if you ask about what's the labor, labor laws or, or holidays, they have no idea and they probably they don't care either because uh, they can come and go at their wish. Right? Uh, so one may be curious about it, then what the, you know, um, uh, cost them or, or, uh, or uh, trigger them to, to work harder in this business. Uh, and then I found interesting the, 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 so I call that um, self-formed work uh, ethics through uh, the peer pressure. So I've quite often heard about uh, that if one um, didn't come to uh, work for a long time and when she uh, appears, other people will say, oh, you didn't come for a long time, uh, you should work harder, you know, you, you, you cannot forget that you want, you, you come here to make more money, you know, something like that. So it's kind of peer pressure to, to, to form the work ethics in this environment, um, which is quite interesting. Uh, and another dimension is about the spatial divisions, as I mentioned earlier uh, in the photos, that there's no clear boundaries between front and back stages. So uh, it also make uh, it, it can also um, uh, referring it to it as a, the make they make a workplace uh, like a home. Um, so in this photo, you can show uh, what I mean by. Uh, Mix the front back stages and uh, uh, mix the workplace and home. Um, so in this photo, you can see this uh, the Venice houses uh, cooks, uh, you know, and they, you know with, with the very casual dress, uh, same within the sandals, right? And they they cook in the kitchen, and not from uh, not afraid of it being seen by their customers or outsiders. So, so everybody pass by can see what they're doing in the rest areas. So they make the workplace uh, like, like a home where you can cook, you can rest, you can chat with the others freely without being uh, uh, seen as a, you know, the professional, uh, uh, as the, how to say it, um, uh, very sloppy, right? And usually those houses has to show their professions, right? And with the very uh, official uh, dressing and sitting there waiting for their customers. But this place, because they're too very low, and I think uh, too low um, to um, form such a street uh, rules. So they are quite flexible. So flexibility is also a very important uh, concept in, in, in my study. And I found um, that because of the flexibility, they don't really feel like there's any like exploitations uh, or operations of women, or things like that uh, in this space. Uh, and uh, um, the final uh, point I want to make is about the, the performed obedience. Uh, and I argue that uh, their behavior um, in this space actually is to follow the mainstream patriarchal ideology, right? Like a woman has to serve men and men as a dominate uh, uh, power uh, and a woman as the, the dominated. But interesting, you can find that also uh, their, this kind of obedience uh, performed in this space also challenge the patriarchal uh, 
uh, or family value at the same time. Um, so um, these behaviors uh, are based on the monetary exchange. Um, so I think it's quite interesting uh, phenomenon to look at. Since the temporality is also an important feature of a uh, Foucault's uh, histotopia, uh, here I want to talk more about the spatial temporality in this business, uh, and I, I use a liminality to describe uh, uh, this phenomenon. Uh, so first of all, I argue that we have to understand the temporality of the Yunnan Dian as a histotopia in two senses. Uh, at the ma macro level, uh, it has to be analyzed in the uh, development of the uh, the context of the development of the sex industry and the trend of the marriage migration. Uh, and at the micro level, we have to uh, look at the um, liminal stages in the hostess life course. So here, next, I want to um, extend my discussion to include how they look at themselves um, during this limit, uh, liminal stage uh, in their life course. So first of all, um, I talk about the time and the space of the liminality, and uh, because most of horses uh, are in, involved in this business outside their expectation, so many of them have the aspirations to toward their futures um, uh, by either uh, finding another man to um, get married again, or to uh, you know to to uh, create their own business. Or like later, I will we'll talk about the Shaqi story, who wants to uh, gain a license of uh, being a, a tourist guide in Taiwan. So this liminality actually also means um, possibilities for them. Um, since they, during that period of time as a uh, hostess, they uh, kind of uh, found out there are, are they, there are many possibilities for them. Um, and also because of the space is very uh, low, uh, no, this low end uh, place gives them a flexibility uh, to think of a more possibility maybe than other women, married migrants engage in factories. Uh, so Xiao Xi, um, when she uh, worked at the, the um, uh, beauty garden. She studied uh, the Kao Gu Ti. You know those exams are very hard, uh, and then she always asked me to read the, the the exam questions for her, and then she just memorized uh, in Chinese. Um, she's from Vietnam, um, and so she works very hard, study very hard, and that dared not to the others uh, to know what she was was doing. Um, so she always covered, you know, used some paper to cover her the exam she was studying. Um, and the two years later, when I vi uh, revisited this place, um, the mama son told me that she she left already um, because uh, her uh, her boyfriend asked her to work in other um, more normal place, maybe a factory. So she left. Um, but um, I still remember the book she introduced to me. Uh, she called "Hai Mei Zhun Bei Hao" the "Cai Zhao Meng Xiang." Uh, means like, uh, we have to be always uh, prepared where for uh, any possibility coming to us. Here, I come to my conclusion. Uh, first of all, my project shows the importance of looking at the social ambivalence spaces like uh, sex entertainment places in modern society. Um, and uh, my project shows uh, how this woman engaged in this business turned the, uh, the, the so-called so social dark corners into a more productive places for their own use. Uh, and the second part, I talk about the law and the business, how this law and the business creates a flexibility in the most marginalized social spaces like uh, Yunnan Dian, and how this uh, flexibility allowed them to engage with more possibility in their uh, life uh, trajectory. And the, finally, I conclude with uh, the uh, possibility of uh, looking at the woman's agency, how, how to conceptualize their engage, engagement or uh, involvement in the business. And uh, I argue that they are not they are not perpetrators of uh, fraudulent marriages, nor victims of uh, uh, trafficking in women, but 
they are ordinary mothers um, who seek to better life for their children. Um, probably I didn't um, discuss it clearly uh, about the, their identities, and the, you know most of them are mothers with the children, um, more than one. Um, and uh, I, I will write this um, in a separate article about uh, who these women are and how uh, their sexuality uh, are uh, contradicted with the, their their identity as mothers and how they deal with uh, this uh, moral um, contradiction. So um, I think that today I, my presentation will end up here, and I welcome your comments and the suggestions. Thank you very much. Great, I have a question for Professor Zheng first. I think women first, and of course myself first. My question would be uh, because I think COVID changed a lot. So uh, you uh, told us that your, um, your research ended 2018, but I believe that 2019 and afterwards, specifically with the prostitution sector, uh, there were many, many changes. And, and I guess that many of your assumptions are no longer true. Uh, what do you think about this? Uh, okay, uh, could you hear me? Can mm -hmm. you hear me? Oh, okay, okay, good. Um, so, so, so for example, what kind of assumption you think I made would be not true? Could, could, could you part, for example? So what? Uh -huh. What about now? No, uh, you uh, told us that you are going to write about the issue um, in the future. Uh, oh, yeah, but yeah, I yeah. think uh, the sex of sex work changed a lot after 2019 because there were many new regulations um, inclu um, because of the COVID policies. We do have many testimonies of uh, sex workers, uh, specifically uh, about foreign sex workers, non-Taiwanese sex workers who had mm, many problems uh, due to the COVID regulations and also the necessity to close uh, the close the the brothels, the gardens. Oh, okay, okay. I got, I, thank you for your question. Now I got what you mean. Um, so first of all, uh, because uh, for my research, uh, they don't really consider themselves uh, so-called sex workers, or uh, this kind of uh, uh, restaurant actually are not, re not, not registered as a Brussels. So I think uh, for them, they kind of uh, um, located in a very, uh, the gray zone. Uh, so that's how the laws um, for regulating sex industry doesn't really apply to uh, this kind of a restaurant, you know. Um, but I know what you mean. And for my research, I found the most uh, impact they have, they receive it because of the change, uh, is that the change of the national laws. Um, because um, nowadays, uh, if they, the, the, the law regulate that once uh, marriage migrants uh, their marriage was was found or convinced that the fraudulent marriages. Then, no matter if the person got their uh, citizenship or not, get their citizenship or not, that they will be, uh, you know, sent back to their home country. So, a huge impact on their uh, jobs. You know, in in this kind of uh, um, entertainment business uh, industry. Um, but so far, uh, before I left my uh, field work, they don't really sense the, um, the, the serious of this problem. Um, so I, I think I may need to go back to look at um, the situation in a more detailed way. And in terms of COVID-19, because uh, during this period of time, I didn't do, I didn't do any follow-up research on that. So I'm not sure if... Uh, uh, if the situation changed, just like uh, what we see 
um, in other uh, parts in the in sales industry. So maybe many, like many of them go online or you know afraid of being uh, contaminated by the, the by COVID, by this uh, virus. So, but for my research, because of this entertainers didn't really have a direct course with their customers. So they may not, they may different, face very different problems from other prostitutes. Thank you. So actually, I would like to address the same question to uh, Professor Jiang and uh, Mr. Deadman, uh, meaning what did COVID change? Because COVID-19 changed a lot for us. Uh, being outside of Taiwan. But I don't know if there are obvious changes like in pride parades. And then, of course, I'm asking you for questions. And if you do have a question, please come here. Come. Yeah. Howard, do you want to start? Yes, please. I only uh, found another here, a listener, who's going to uh, pose your question. Mm -hmm. Howard, do you want to respond? Uh, go ahead, go ahead, because I think it's more directly to the topic of Pride Parade, but I'll follow up. Okay, thank you for the question. Um, so in terms of COVID impacts, um, as I think many of you would be aware, uh, during 2020, um, there was relatively little impact of COVID in terms of daily life in Taiwan. Um, we were spared uh, lockdowns and things like that. And I, I actually arrived in Taiwan on January 2nd of 2020, about a week before the presidential election, uh, and spent the next 20 months in Taiwan. So um, I felt very fortunate in the sense that Taiwan was one of the few countries that was able to hold pride parades in person um, in 2020. So in terms of COVID impacts, um, you know, I think one thing that maybe it did indirectly was that it made Taiwanese in general and Tongzhi more specifically around parades feel even uh, prouder of their country for being, you know, for having uh, done so well with the pandemic. Um, now, in 2021, uh, because of the outbreak in Taiwan from May to August or so, September, um, Pride for the first time was held, or Taipei Pride, which is called Taiwan Pride. Uh, was held online in October of last year. Um, I guess it remains to be seen for this year, but hopefully it'll be back in person because this year is the 20th anniversary of the Taiwan Pride Parade. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah, I haven't thought about the impact of COVID-19 on um, the history of Transtopia, uh, but I will say, you know, two things very quickly, you know, in the last few years, um, and this is actually more kind of borrowing from Adam's presentation that, you know, that there is a, a very stark and um, sharp sense of uh, Taiwanese sovereignty in relation to uh, queer politics. Um, and especially if you take into account uh, the differences across the Taiwan, across the Taiwan Strait. So while, you know, uh, things might uh, seem to be more positive, and things seem to be actually more reinforcing of this notion of Taiwanese sovereignty in the island. Um, actually, there's more repression and uh, well-known repression in mainland China. So this, I think this is going to reinforce certain kind of uh, contrast and differences across the Taiwan Straits. And of course, my hope is that, you know, there should be more dialogues and conversations between the center of the world and mainland China. But I do think that this does call attention to that. So th that is one uh, aspect of queer politics. So you see more repression in China. As you may know, the Pride Parade in Shanghai has been um, uh, basically shut down, uh, I think, forever. Uh, and there's more uh, stories about crackdowns and bars and, of course, um, crackdowns on campuses in China as well. Whereas if there's a possibility of holding online parade, uh, pride parade in Taiwan, it shows you that contrast. And my hope is that there can be more conversations 
and, and, and discussions about how activist strategies can uh, circulate across these borders. But I think going back to the issue of COVID-19, though, there's one thing that we need to address very seriously, right? Over this course of the last few years, we see Taiwan's, you know, on the one hand, it's a matter of Taiwan's sovereignty, but on the other, it's really uh, these international agencies such as the WHO that continues to refuse to take Taiwan seriously. So I think it's actually related, although this is a little bit of a side uh, note, but I do think that it is related to the notion of Taiwanese sovereignty if, in fact, Taiwan actually was pretty successful in containing COVID-19 uh, for geographical reasons, for other kinds of reasons. Why is it the case that WHO continues to uh, refuse to recognize uh, Taiwan as an important player at that point in time? So I think that's related. Although on the one hand, we're dealing with uh, queer politics. On the other hand, we're dealing with health politics. But ultimately, it circles back to uh, Taiwan's notion of sovereignty. But I haven't thought about that with respect to Transtopia. Uh, hello, this is Rita from NTU. Oh, okay. So, hi, uh, I have a question for uh, Adam and Dr. Zhang. So, I'm just going to frame it in, in a more related way. So, basically, uh, my own research also showed that, you know, this like Taiwan pride, like the same-sex marriage and Tongzhi, you know, pride becomes like a, like a token of national identity, right? Uh, and yes. then people are becoming like, oh, okay, because the same-sex marriage will have such an increased uh, global visibility and stuff like that. And I've also heard, you know, counter argument that Tongzhi are just being used as a prop for by the government. And the same argument actually was made about uh, Xie Jianshun in the 50s. And there, are, uh, there were uh, data about that case suggesting that Xie Jianshun was actually not willing to go through the operation, but the KMT government needed that case to show that they were very progressive, right? We're really different from, you know, uh, the, the People's Republic of China because we were, we were progressive. Like a, uh, so how do we approach the topic of sovereignty and the potential of these, you know, sexual minorities being used as probably being co-opt into this nation building uh, strategy. Thank you. Hmm. So I have a lot of thoughts about that, but maybe I'll defer to Howard first to respond to the transtopia uh, part of that question first. Yeah, thank you so much, Rita, for this uh, very important question. Um, it, right, so we are dealing with uh, two variables at the same time. And that's why this uh, compounding uh, equation makes it difficult to disentangle, right? Or are we actually talking about um, a region's uh, nationalism or sovereignty, or are we actually talking about interest of gender and sexual minorities? So first of all, I think it's uh, important to um, acknowledge, right, that uh, if we are dealing with different historical context, I think the meaning of sovereignty will invariably shift. Okay, so this is even within the uh, historical time frame and framework of Taiwan. If you talk about uh, the 1950s, um, you know, it, it is a very peculiar point in time, isn't it? It is at a point where uh, Zhang Jiexi's regime came to Taiwan and took over. It was not you know, it was not this this relationship to Mao's China is very different, right, from today's relationship. At that point in time, Jiang could um, uh, reasonably claim, right, even from the perspective of the United Nations, that Taiwan is actually hold, Republic of China is holding the seat, resembling mm -hmm. representing China. So there's a way in which you know that 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 notion of nationalism then is not, doesn't add up to what the kind of nationalism you're talking about today in, 20, in 2000 and, two, and 2020s, right? And that you're talking about the fact that now Taiwanese independence, Taiwanese nationalism, there's no, uh, almost no room, international room for that level of legibility and recognition. So we're already talking about very different things. So I would, I would actually uh, back up and say that this, if there's a, uh, approach to generalize 
these both in, in both cases, uh, but just by dismissing and saying that oh, uh, a queer, queer subject and sexual minorities are just being used as a prop for uh, you know pushing for some kind of nationalism or homo nationalism, I would actually push back a little and say, well, you need to actually acknowledge that there is actually historical differences and complexity behind each of these cases. You're absolutely right. I'm really glad that, by the way, you brought up the case of Xie Jian Shun uh, because uh, she did. Um, uh, how do I put it? She did initially resist right these surgeries. Um, she didn't feel quite at home. Uh, I will say that I think this is actually an opportunity for scholars and queer historians in general to actually not uh, put one framework for thinking about transness or queerness as the only way of recognizing queer subjects. Because if right, if if there's only one Western way of talking about transsexuality or transness, then the subject, whether you're talking about Xie Jianshun or the other one I talked about in my presentation, Marta Omos, um, their case will all will never live up to this true model of transness. And I think I will actually step back a little bit too from that approach and say that if we are uh, uh, indeed making room for a range, a spectrum of queer and trans articulations, then we can entertain a much more capacious and fluid notions of how these queerness actually intersect uh, with whether it's about the politics of Chinese-ness or the politics of sovereignty. So I think that's where we, we, can, we can push your question into two directions. One is to destabilize what we might mean by nationalism or sovereignty. And the other is to destabilize and deconstruct what we might mean by queerness and transness. Yeah. Great, Howard, thanks. Um, uh, Rita, thank you again for the question and I appreciate all the help that you gave me when I was uh, in Taiwan doing my field work. You were a great uh, encouragement and informant. So um, I think, you know, like Howard uh, was just suggesting um, sort of what's to me, what that question, which we often hear from, you know, certain critics in um, queer, through queer scholarship in Taiwan, um, is this sort of vilification of, of all forms of nationalism, right? That that nationalism is inherently a um, a negative force. That nationalism is inherently something that is just a ruse or a tool of political elites. Um, and if we if we buy those assumptions, then we're we're discounting or we're discrediting the uh, more grassroots or society based um, forms of of positive contributions vis-a-vis um, -vis nationalism. And so um, part of my, my dissertation is trying to rethink the relationship between uh, nationalism and uh, sexuality studies in Taiwan, because there has been what I see as a an unfair vilification of uh, so-called Taiwanese nationalism. I think I prefer to call it a pro-Taiwan stance, you know, um, Taiwan Li Chang, whatever you want to, um, define it as. But I think that, um, you know, this idea that's been uh, kind of circulating that, you know, the DPP, this is going back to Petrus Leo and other people who have written about, you know, the DPP uses um, this idea of, uh, you know, Ping Chuan, this kind of stuff as a way to, uh, you know, sort of uh, enhance its international visibility and recognition. Well, I think on one hand, we have to recognize that Taiwan is a contested state, right? And so when you are a contested state, the form that sovereignty is going to take is quite anomalous from so-called right? It's different. And so if we don't keep these kinds of nuances in, in mind when we think about nationalism and sexual politics, I think we end up with a skewed uh, kind of conclusion. Um, and just to end this uh, comment, um, I interviewed Miao Boya, who I think many of you would know as an openly lesbian uh, Taipei city councilor when I was in Taiwan. And she said, and I posed this question to her, and she said, you know, um, that a lot of people in Taiwan voted for Tsai Ing-wen because of her uh, campaign promise to pass same-sex marriage, and that a positive outcome of that, um, you know, is the difference between Taiwan and China. Uh, but that that positive outcome is a byproduct and not the main motivation of people like activists and legislators who pushed for it. Um, because she suggested it was the right thing to do um, and that the added benefit of Taiwan being recognized internationally for it is again, like I said, a byproduct. So I think it's, you know, it's a, it depends on your perspective, right? Um, but if we are, if we are sort of 
beginning from the perspective that all forms of nationalism are inherently negative and manipulated by the state, then we'll come up with a very different conclusion than the one I suggest um, you know, most Tongzhu would uh, adhere to in Taiwan. So thanks for that great question. And if I can just add one very quick comment, because um, I know we're running out of time, but, you know, this, this point is actually very important, right? That, you know, we shouldn't start with one preconceived notion of what nationalism is. And I think we are ready to give up nationalism if we want to. Uh, but the idea is that, you know, the alliances that we're seeing in these presentations today, right? The connection between Hong Kong and Taiwan that Adam's referring to, or the connections uh, between Yunnan and Taiwan in Xinhui's rep uh, representation, uh, these are kind of minor to minor relations, right? And that they are not, they're not necessarily, right? The fact that Hong Kong can be connected to Taiwan is not that Hong Kong is also pushing for another kind of nationalism per se. Uh, there can be different terms, but the idea is that we are dealing with sovereignty. And if you're dealing with sovereignty, it has to do with uh, certain claims about uh, territory and certain claims about subjectivity and agency. Um, and so it is not to say that we can just simply dismiss uh, right, dismiss the internal workings. There's a lot of unequal and imbalanced workings that Xinhui talks about in her presentation. And so that's something that we should also call attention to if we are to talk about something like heterotopia. So I think that this is a very important point to say that there shouldn't be just a kind of one um, homogenous model of nationalism with which we start and then we just dismiss it. Yes. Okay. Um, hi, uh, my name is Susan. Um, I was here to ask a few questions, but I also want to be wary of time. I don't know if speakers are all right with staying for a few more minutes. Um, okay, I see, here, I see some nods. Okay, okay, glad to, okay. Glad to see that. Um, but before I ask my own questions, I know there was like a question in chat that preceded mine. So maybe you could direct our, ten our attention there first. So there was um, a, a comment here from that um, brings the interesting contrast between transtopia and heterotopia from two of our speakers. And asks, um, may I ask what has inspired you both to focus on the topia ideas and what are the current forces or factors of dystopia in Taiwan and beyond that systemically, that sy systematically hinder your cases to pursue either trans or heterogeneous spaces? Thank you, yeah. For, for me, because I, you know, I, I borrowed from uh, Foucault's idea and I try, try to try to uh, explore and uh, to uh, do some ex ex expectations, how this ideal could help me to think about an alternative order in, in, in Taiwan. And uh, actually, I, I think I may need to do more research on that to look into different Thai about the uh, entertainment, especially this kind of a low end entertainment places in Taiwan, to reflect what kind of the uh, alternative social space uh, these people involved in the business can create to, as I said, to mirror or questions the mainstream uh, morals or ideals and uh, what kind of a, a force it can, uh, can be created. But, you know, I'm quite aware of uh, uh, the the possibility of the over romanticize this resistance from these people. So I'm trying to say that uh, their, 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 their involvement in this business and their challenge, the behavior, the challenges of the, uh, uh, against this uh, social structure is kind of a uh, byproduct of their involvement in this business. They are not doing that on purpose. Um, so, but, but Interesting, we will see the consequence that they, in the end, they really challenge at least our perceptions of the law and entertainment business, what we always call that the so called the and they, you know, when we see the mass media representing uh, this house, they always, you know, they hide themselves and, uh, you know, it looks like they do something wrong, right? So that, that's really something that I want to. Uh, explore more about this so-called dark economy or dark corners in which how people could create a, a certain type of space that would be uh, different from um, our, you know, like mainstream social space where we see the very uh, systematic, maybe like systematic uh, 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 rules or certain type of uh, laws we follow. But uh, as I said, they do have their own rules and the sets in that marginalized the space. Uh, this is what I uh, want to try to uh, uh, analyze in my, in my study. 
Yeah, in my case, um, I I was looking for a term. Um, you know, I was looking for a term that could summarize a lot of the my responses to some of the trends in our in the field of queer theory, right? So, as you know, uh, there's a lot of discussions about queer utopia and queer dystopia, um, and my hope was that you know the topia part could really in the case of today's discussion, to really call attention to the importance of place and geographical location. And th so there's a very specific reason why some of the case examples in the book that I pick, n all of them actually don't fit in a, a traditional sense of nation states framework. And that's why I want to call attention to their alliances and relationships. So I want to look for a term that, that, that indicates much more explicitly a space. But I think to be honest, um, I've always, as a historian, I've always been very, um, you know, I've been always been very interested in the role of imagination. Uh, in our scholarship, but also in politics as well. And I think this topia part uh, oftentimes does um, uh, prompt a certain notion of imagination, right? Whether you think transtopia is a form of utopia or dystopia, it does prompt uh, that kind of response. And I think it's very important because I do think, you know, on the one hand, uh, we are nowhere near to a universe or a world in which uh, transphobia has been completely eliminated. Actually, we're probably um, far from that, maybe further from that after the uh, overturning of Roe, unfortunately. Um, so, so, so I'm hoping that that could serve as kind of an engine for, for, for thinking, for, for imagination. And, and I think there are a lot of forces, you're right, uh, in Chao that, that, that are preventing us from moving in that direction, not um, including the conservative forces in the West, but also there's a growing conservative force in different parts of the Asia Pacific as well, right? And these are responses to some of the progress that we've made, including the marriage, marriage equality movements. There are conservative forces in different parts of Asia is responding to that. So, so they're a cause of concern. Thank you all. And um, I have two questions and I hope, I'm really, I really appreciate that you're staying over for a few more extra minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I also wanted to like say just how much I appreciate your presentation, especially with the overturn of Roe recently. This, is, this has been really like eye-opening and like helpful in terms of understanding more. <laughs> about myself and about queerness in Taiwan. Um, I have two questions that are more methodology related. Uh, and so I'm curious about Dr. Jiang and Dr. Zeng, both of your research. Um, for Dr. Jiang, I'm very curious about how you use the pronouns in English, because um, I'm sure everyone in this room understands that like in Mandarin, the pronouns just sound the same. And so sometimes when I am in like Tongzhi circles in Taiwan, um, pronouns for trans folks don't have the same, they have a different representation meaning to folks than here in the US. And so I'm curious how you have um, used pronouns in English when you're writing these different historical figures and people. And for Dr. Zeng, I'm so fascinated by how you build relationships with the mothers in your research um, and particularly how you use photography. I'm very curious about how that uh, became part of your approach and how um, consent was like a part of that process. Um, I might be doing community work in the future. I'm very curious about how you build that rapport. Yeah. And thank you all. And I'm going to return to my seat, but I'm going to give you my thanks first. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Um, I, I just want to say very quickly that this, this has uh, received more attention as of late among queer historians. Um, I don't think there is a, um, you know, absolute consensus yet. Yeah. But in my own work, you know, especially when I'm trying to write a history, I try to um, respect as much as possible and to the best of my ability, the gender identification of the historical individual in question. Um, it gets a bit tricky, right? Especially if you want to talk about a biography or transfigure. Mm -hmm. And um, if, if the transition is a very important part of that story, and if the, you know, the, the figure also think that transition is a very part of their life experience, when you want to move from the childhood era to their adulthood, there, you know, that um, 
uh, pronoun usage is pretty tricky. So there, there are some uh, queer historians that are starting to advocate for a non-binary approach and that, you know, the advocate that for any historical figures that you simply don't know their gen identification, you should just start from outright using the word they instead of he or she. So, but so, so I just want to mention that there are different kind of practices that are circulating, um, but that's kind of how I do it. I try to respect to the best of my ability what I consider to be the gender self-identification of the uh, person in question. We uh, behaved like we usually do in Taiwan, we are very much over time. Uh, so I would like to thank the audience, but I also thank our virtual speakers. I think I would like and I would need to conclude this session, but I'm sure all three of you uh, would be welcome if there are questions left, then simply write the question into the chat and will be answered somehow. Thanks, everybody. <laughs>